Hello and welcome to this video on couples, resources and decision making and domestic violence. As well as inequality in who does what in the home, there is inequality in who gets what. So we've already seen how men and women take on different roles in the household and there are arguments with regards to inequality there in so much as that women seem to undertake the triple shift or the dual burden in the household. This is linked to who controls the family's income and who has the power to make decisions. And we generally find that even today, because in a heterosexual couple, men generally earn more than women, it's men who are making the decisions in the household. Barrett and McIntosh did some research into this area and found that men get more from women's labour than they give back in financial support. So if we imagine women's labour as being undertaking the childcare and the housework, the cooking and the cleaning, and perhaps even the emotional labour, there is actually a cost that we could attach to that labour, even if we were paying it simply minimum wage. If we then look at the amount of money that actually men give to their wives or husbands give to their wives to pay for that labour in the home, generally men are paying below, shall we say, minimum wage or below uh, how much that labour actually is worth. The financial support men give comes with strings attached and we often find for example that men will demand certain things to happen in the household according to their tastes so they may want certain foods to be made for them or for the children to be grow up in a certain way or they may even demand sexual favors or um, sexual acts in return for the money being provided regularly men also make the big decisions about money so when it comes to those big decisions with regards to say selling the house or perhaps going on a holiday often it's men who are making those decisions because they have a financial cost attached Kempson found that in working class families women actually deny their own needs so in the scenario say where husbands are giving their wives an allowance to pay for all the bits and pieces in the household from week to week uh, mums or wives would often think to themselves, well, hold on, even though I need perhaps some new clothes or I need some new toiletries or something related to that, actually, I'm going to put that off because I'd rather spend that money on the children or the household. So in the sense, working class women were denying their own needs to um, further meet the needs of the rest of the members of the family. Graham interviewed separated wives, separated women, and found that they stated that uh, upon separation, if the children or the family was now in receipt of some sort of benefit. Actually, they were better off than previously when perhaps the relationship hadn't quite ended and the money was being received in an allowance system. So in that scenario, actually, it was almost financially better to be separated. Often, no money is set aside specifically for women or for wives who will see spending on themselves as denying money for their families and children. So once again, uh, often no money is specifically put aside for mums or for wives to spend on themselves whether that be for clothes or for toiletries, or whether that be for even you know, some basic ent entertainment or leisure activities. What often happens is mums just think, well, that money's got to go to provide for the children. They're going to need new school clothes, food, new materials, whatever, and they'd often rather spend it on there. So that's an unfair and unequal position, we would say. Paul and Vogler looked at how each partner's contribution to family income affects decision making. They found that there were two types of control over family income, namely pooling and the allowance system. Pooling is joint responsibility for expenditure. So what tends to happen here is if you have a dual earner couple or a dual earner family, i.e. mum and dad are both earning and they both put their money together into a pool or into a shared pot, such as say a joint bank account, what then happens is actually the couple share the responsibility for expenditure. So they actually will discuss with each other, okay, how we're going to spend the money, what's the best way to do this. The other system is perhaps a more traditional or old school system, which is the allowance system, where the husband goes out to earn and will pay the wife an allowance for all expenditures and will keep any surplus, i.e. anything that's left over, for themselves. And often men will, or the husbands will spend it on their own leisure activities, such as going to the pub or hanging out with friends. So... There we have the two different types of systems, two different control systems over family income. Vogler found that there's been a sharp increase uh, in pooling over recent years from 19% to 50%. It's probably higher even more so now. And a decrease in the allowance system from 36% to 12%, which may again be even lower today. Pooling is more common in dual earner households, but men still make major financial decisions, it would seem. 
Hardell found that men's careers still take priority. So even if mum and dad are both earning, they're dual earners, often uh, women will defer to their husbands and will say, well, your job is more important or your job earns more money. And so therefore we will you know, cater the family's life or existence around your career. Finch found something similar. Women's lives are shaped around their husband's career. So if the husband, uh, say, was to get a new job or if the job was to move to a different part of the country, often wives are the ones who are expected to you know, leave their job and to you know, prepare the family for moving for meeting the needs of their husbands. Edgell ranked decisions made in households into three different types. Firstly, very important decisions. These tend to be financial in nature and they were generally taken exclusively by the husband. Important decisions, which are often related to something happening to the children or maybe to holiday destinations, and these tended to be taken jointly. And less important decisions, which could be everything from how the house is decorated to buying clothes for the children and doing the weekly shop, these were almost exclusively taken by women or wives. So there's different types of decisions being made in the household, and they are separate separated or segregated amongst husbands and wives and again it would appear that men are making the more important decisions. This is often the case because men are still earning more than women in the workplace and so it would appear almost as if because men are earning more it gives them more sort of gravitas or it gives them more power in that debate or discussion. And feminists would dispute this however and argue that actually it's the process by which children are socialised into their gender and gender roles it's the way culture operates, which is very gendered and still is patriarchal in nature. That is to say, it empowers men over women. And the gender scripts that men and women play, the expectations of how they have to behave in a relationship according to heteronormative culture, would seem to suggest that women should defer to men. So feminists would have issues with this and say it's unfair and unequal. A different perspective is the personal life perspective of money. Nyman suggests that money has no automatic fixed or natural meaning to it and every couple defines this and who controls it in a different way so this seems to intimate that it's more of a, a discussion being had between husbands and wives or by partners same-sex couples often give different meanings to the control of money in relationships some research suggests that same-sex couples attach no importance to who controls the money and this links to the idea of there being no gender scripts in homosexual couples or lesbian couples so it would appear that in same-sex couples actually just because you make the decisions about the money or you don't make the decisions about the money doesn't mean you have more or less power. Weeks found that co-independence in couples where there is some sharing, but both partner retains control over some money and retains a sense of independence. So this might be a scenario where you have a couple who may have been together for a long time. They may be married, they may not. Uh, they are living together most likely and making decisions together, but they may retain control over their own finances. They may not be pooling, as it were. Next, we need to consider domestic violence. A good definition comes from the Women's Aid Federation, who define domestic violence as physical, psychological, sexual or financial violence that takes place within an intimate or family-typed relationship and forms a pattern of coercive and controlling behaviour. It may involve partners, ex-partners, household members or other relatives. It's quite a useful definition to have in the back of our mind. In terms of some statistics on domestic violence, the Home Office released these in 2013. Around 1.2 million women suffered domestic abuse, over 400,000 women were sexually assaulted, and 70,000 women were raped, and thousands more were stalked. So this was in the year 2012, leading up to that report from the Home Office. Furthermore, the British Crime Survey in 2007 found that domestic violence accounts for almost a sixth of all violent crime. Murley's Black found that most victims of domestic violence are women. 99% of all incidents against women are committed by men and nearly one in four has been assaulted by a partner at some time in her life and nearly one in eight repeatedly so. So some quite stupendous and terrifying statistics there. Dobash and Dobash, and there they are in the top right-hand corner, did some interesting studies into domestic violence in 1979 and in 2007. 
Her research was based in Scotland. It was based on police and court reports and records, as well as interviews with women in women's refuges. There were examples of wives being slapped, pushed about, beaten, raped and killed by their husbands. And violent incidents could be set off by what a husband saw as a challenge to their authority. So, for example, wives asking why the husband was late home. They argued that marriage legitimates violence, that makes it appears to be normal and acceptable, by conferring power and authority on husbands and dependency on wives. So Dobash and Dobash seem to be stating here that there's something about marriage in particular that causes this power dynamic to come about. Generally, when we think about domestic violence, we think of violence by men towards women. But there are male victims of domestic violence, and often these male victims have gone ignored. But recently, or in more contemporary times, more focus and spotlight has been placed upon this issue. There's a good quote here from the Independent newspaper from 2013. It was titled, As a man, it's very difficult to say I've been beaten up. He struggles to keep it together when he recalls the day his girlfriend smashed a bottle of Jack Daniels across his head, leaving him bleeding on the pavement. A deep scar is still clearly visible on his forehead. But when the 45-year-old from Essex describes the relief of being believed by the authorities, he breaks down, his broad shoulders heaving beneath a, his rugby shirt. Now, there's quite an evocative image being created in that short statement. And you may want to take a moment now to consider this question whilst pausing the video. That is, why do you think men are less likely to report being victims of domestic abuse? One in three victims of domestic abuse in Britain is male, but refuge beds for men are critically scarce. Refuges are places of sanctuary where individuals who have suffered some form of abuse can go to and they can receive support and help and counselling. At the same time, they can also hide there, essentially, away from the person who is abusing them. There are 78 spaces which can be used by men in refuges around Britain, of which only 33 are dedicated rooms for men. The rest can be taken by victims of either gender. So there's an awful lot of spaces, as we're about to see, for women, but not so many for men. This compares to around with 4,000 spaces for women. In Northern Ireland, Scotland, there are no male refuges at all. So there seems to be a big disparity in terms of how charities operate and how the money is available for men who are victims of domestic violence. Although, arguably, it's borne out by the statistics where we still find, for the most part, that domestic Abuse is something suffered by women at the hands of men. Now, there are a number of issues or problems with studying domestic violence. One of the main problems in studying this is the difficulty of obtaining valid information. That's information that is true to reality on the subject. Official police statistics rely on reports they receive from individuals and the recording of these incidents by the police. The issue here is not every moment or instance or example of domestic abuse or domestic violence is necessarily being recorded. Not all the victims report them to the police and sometimes the police may misrepresent the information they are receiving and place it in a different category. So the statistics may be invalid. With other methods, such as interviews or self-completed questionnaires, people may refuse to answer, misunderstand the question, lie, exaggerate or forget. The researcher may also misunderstand or misclassify the answers given. It is possible that male researchers may receive different answers from female researchers. There are also difficulties in defining domestic violence in the first place. So these are some issues that sociologists have to deal with when they are studying domestic violence. And this links nicely to some of the issues that we will look at when we think about research methods. Stephanie Yernshire found that on average a woman will suffer abuse 35 times before making a report and so not every single one of those instances of abuse may necessarily be reported so again the statistics may be skewed. It is the violent crime that is least likely to be reported so we think about all the different violent crimes that take place in the UK, everything from muggings to murders, is domestic violence or domestic abuse which is least likely to be reported. 
and the police and prosecutors may be unlikely to want to record, investigate or prosecute these cases. They often do not want to get involved in what they see as family matters. Now, this was more of an issue in the past, but even today, some police officers may think, oh, not for me, don't really want to investigate this, don't really want to get involved. It's a domestic matter, a domestic dispute, and so they tend not to report it as perhaps they always should. There are a range of different sociological explanations for domestic violence. Millet and Firestone, two radical feminists, firstly argue that all societies are founded on patriarchy, which is male dominance, that men are the enemy and they are women's natural oppressors and exploiters, and the way in which men are socialised within patriarchy means that they use violence or the threat of violence as a way of keeping women under control. So it's not even unusual that men would behave this way within patriarchal society. Marxist feminists would argue that domestic violence is the product of capitalism, that male workers are exploited at work and that when they come home, they take out their frustrations and angers on their wives. So this is why domestic violence occurs. However, this doesn't explain why women are abusive to their male partners, which does occur, or why not all men are abusive. So it would appear that if capitalism is to blame, it's working in a very patchwork way. Finally, the materialist explanation. This approach focuses on economic and material factors such as inequalities in income and housing to explain why some groups are more at risk to domestic violence than others. You may want to pause for a moment and consider which groups or which groups of women are most likely to be victims of domestic violence. Wilkinson and Pickett see domestic violence as the result of stress on family members caused by social inequality. Inequality means that some families have fewer resources than others and those living on low incomes or in overcrowded accommodation are likely to experience high levels of stress. This reduces their chances of maintaining stable, caring relationships and therefore increases the risk of conflict and violence, or indeed domestic violence. Those with less power, status, wealth or income are often at greatest risk. And so we generally find that it's amongst the working classes, those living in poverty, those from black Asian minority ethnic backgrounds who are marginalised in our society, along with other groups who are most likely to suffer from domestic violence of some form. That's it. Thank you very much.